It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur, CBS News correspondent, and Thomas J. Hamilton, Chief United Nations Correspondent for the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Krishna Menon, Chairman of the Indian Delegation to the United Nations. You know, it's almost an unwritten law that unless a diplomat represents one of the big four powers, he cannot achieve a position of world influence and significance. But our guest tonight has proved the exception to the rule. When Mr. Krishna Menon speaks, the world now listens. Mr. Menon, to be perfectly frank, you have disagreed with our foreign policy rather often publicly, and some people do say that you are unfriendly to this country. Is that true? We have disagreed. When I say I have disagreed, I have expressed the opinions of my country and my government on specific matters that come up for discussion. And I should have thought, and I do think, that the American people will be the first to recognize that honest opinions, properly expressed with courtesy and candor, are signs of friendship. I, I have the good fortune to have large numbers of Americans as friends. I know you do. Mr. Do you think that uh, our country and its foreign policy has ever been uh, unfriendly or unjust to, to your country? We have never questioned the motives of this country, and we don't, no country should or does, in fact, sit down and write a dissertation on another country's foreign policy. Uh, when any particular act of yours has any impact upon someone else, that someone else says something. And that's all there is to it. I think there is a lot of uh, exaggeration or misstatement about uh, difficulties or relationships between India and the United States. On the other hand, we, I think we are two friendly countries. With honest differences of opinion on certain matters, and a great deal of agreement on others. How do you feel about the latest matter that's come before the assembly of Mr. Christian Mellon? That's the affair of the 11 American aviators who are still held prisoners by the Chinese Communists. Really, I'm surprised that a very accurate reporter, a uh, column writer like this Thomas, Thomas Hamilton should think that it's come before the assembly. It hasn't come yet. When it comes, we'll deal with it. Well, uh, since India did perform uh, vital services, uh, in the Korean War as medical troops and also very vital services after the war in uh, securing and helping secure the release of the prisoners of war. Mr. Menon, how do you regard the fact that the Chinese are holding uh, belligerents from that war in apparent defiance of the armistice terms? We, we don't know. We don't know the facts of this matter in, 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 any, in any way apart from what is matters of public knowledge. We, so far as I'm aware, we have not been asked by anybody uh, to intervene in this matter or to take an interest in it. We have naturally, as, as one, as every country and every human being must have, an interest in a problem where there are prisoners detained in another country. Now you ask me about the commission. The commission has ceased to exist. And our interests, uh, our, uh, our responsibilities in that matter are the same as everybody else's, except, of course, that uh, we want to see uh, any, any point of conflict between countries removed, whether it's with us or anybody else. Yes, and this might possibly be a point of, uh, of rather deep conflict between uh, the uh, Communist China and the United States. Well, Mr. Menon, if I may say so, you have avoided in the past, and your country has, criticism of Red China. And some people do feel that since you're not with us, therefore you must be against us. Is this a correct assessment of your position? No, we are not against anybody. As I said, that we have very, very good relations <coughs> with this country. And we do not regard good relations with you as exclusive of good relations with others. And that perhaps is not quite well understood. There is no reason why good relations with one country should exclude good relations with another. Unless you're partisans. And we are not partisans. Well, Mr. Mann, I think it's only fair to say that uh, people have the feeling that the so-called neutrality of Asia and India actually means that uh, these countries are sitting on a fence waiting to join the camp of, which, of either side which proves to be the strongest protector. Now, and therefore we think that every inch we sacrifice to communism or surrender to communism is actually influencing your future decision. Now, is this true? I don't know who thinks so. We don't. And uh, we have never called ourselves neutral. In fact, the term neutrality has significance only in conditions of war. 
what we are, are we, have, we are an independent sovereign nation entitled to make its decisions on every issue uh, as, as we think best in our interests and the interests of other people. What we may not do is to question other people's motives of people whom we have no, no reason to question it or introduce any bitterness or anger into controversy. We must keep our differences honest and uh, within the limits of necessity. And that's what we try to do. We may fail, but that's what we try to do. On a specific point, Mr. Christian Menon, you are quite active at the Geneva Conference in, I think, trying to pass on the points of view of the different sides, delegates, so on. Looking back on the, on the Geneva Conference, and particularly the settlement of Indochina, do you think it was a good settlement? I think so. I think it was a, not only, not, the, the real question is not whether it was a good settlement, I think it was a good settlement. But the settlement itself was a good thing to achieve. We have for the first time a situation where there is no major war going on. The Indo-Chinese business, as you know, is in its origin a colonial issue, and it, it now enables the peoples of Indochina to establish governments, and I have no doubt at all that it will settle down, uh, provided the terms of settlement are carried out, and I have no reason to think they won't be carried out. Do you have any reason for, for concern over the possibility that the Chinese communists might use the infiltration against the governments of Laos and Cambodia and southern Vietnam? I have no evidence of it. There are communists, no doubt, in all these, in all these areas, indigenous inhabitants are communists, but I have no reason to think that there will be any infiltration from outside. And the armistice agreement provides uh, for the supervision uh, of those infiltrations, and they're being carried out. Well, your government is not a party to the Southeast Asia Pact. Could you give me your feelings as to whether the Southeast Asia Pact will help stabilize the situation in, in Southeast Asia? We do not think so. If we thought it would have helped to stabilize the situation in Southeast Asia, we would have accepted the invitation to join it. Well. Uh, Mr. Christian Menenda, if Ms. Nehru's uh, plans come to fruition, do you envisage a world in which there are uh, really three worlds, if we may put it that way, a so-called Western world, a communist world, and a so-called neutral world with you as sort of a buffer? I hope not, Mr. Nehru. Uh, I think this is a very wrong way of looking at it. Uh, this is what is usually called the third block or third force theories. Uh, we, are, we do not believe that this division of uh, the world into camps of this kind is a good thing uh, for stability and peace and the fortunes of all of us. If we think that, and we therefore do not like two blocks, how would we help by forming a third block? It would only add to the confusion. Well, in other words, you think there should be one world, just one block? No, I think that uh, in the present state of our civilization, there should be independent, sovereign nations respecting each other, living and letting live, tolerating each other, and, and, and trying to resolve such differences as there, there are and would be by negotiation and argument, and then they won't come into as major differences. But isn't it true, Mr. Menon, that sadly enough, the dynamics of the world prove that very often nations which ask for the respect of other nations are gobbled up by aggressors, and so people do form blocks for protection? Now, first of all, Mr. Lasso, uh, there is a limit to the usefulness of the past, because if your argument were true, then you would have to, to agree that all history has been written. We are the architects of history, we make it. Therefore, we can't say it has been so, therefore it will be so. Mr. Krishnamanan, I've heard it said that uh, since India's constitution, I understand, is very much like the constitution of the United States, that uh, certain conclusions might be drawn about India's newly won independence from the independence of the United States in its early years. Do you see any uh, uh, counterpart in our early history and your present state of development? No, uh, to put our history right, uh, when the Indian Constitution was made, it drew on the experience of uh, practically all countries that have constitutions. But um, our Constitution is fundamentally different from the Constitution of the United States because we have a parliamentary system of government. It is more like the Anglo-Saxon or the British system of government where we have an executive that's responsible to legislature and is part of that legislature. It is true that uh, there are certain parts of it, for example, uh, the, the chapter on fundamental rights is perhaps has a, has a relation to proximity to your Bill of Rights. 
to, 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 to cause some rights. But um, the rest of it is, is made up of the experience of various countries and our own. After all, we also had a constitution, though not a perfect parliament, and uh, the desires and the genius of our people. Mr. Christian, and I must say that some people here wonder why India seems so severe to its own indigenous communists and relatively so polite to uh, foreign or international communists. Why is that so? Well, uh, you get that picture because you have certain premises, you have certain assumptions. What we do is we try to run a country on, on, on the basis of the rule of law. And those who break the law come under the rigors of the law. That is to say, it goes beyond a certain limit. We have no objection in our country for anybody holding any opinion. We have no objection to their forming political parties. We have no objection from any political party standing for parliament. But if that party tries to uh, practice violence, breaks the law, then it comes under the, under the rigors of the law. And we have a parliamentary opposition which is very different from that of the governing party. And I suppose that would hold true in international world too. Anyone who breaks the law, you would uh, well, abhor to. Well, so far as we are concerned, we do not want anybody to interfere in our country. And uh, irrespective of what their, what their private political thinking is. And uh, any interference or encroachment upon our liberties would meet with our hostility. How far we can resist it depends upon our strength. But um, the, the real issue is whether there's interference with us. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Christopherman. It's been a great pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. The opinions expressed on the Longine Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Thomas J. Hamilton. Our distinguished guest was Krishna Menon, chairman of the Indian delegation to the United Nations. A Longine watch makes the most perfect Christmas gift. It has beauty, elegance, and an enduring reputation as just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. Now, actually, barring accident or abuse, the Longine watch which you give this Christmas will be better than new after five or even after ten years of daily use. Time holds no terrors for a Longine. The exquisitely finished watch movement defies normal wear and friction, achieves unsurpassed timekeeping accuracy and reliability. Thus does Longines inner quality match Longines outer elegance. Among the finest watches of the world, only Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Cased in precious metal, styled in the best of good taste, a Longines watch is a joy to own, an enduring symbol of your affection, the perfect Christmas gift. Yet you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as seventy-one fifty. Visit your Longines Whitnor jeweler agency and make your selection. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Lacoultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Lacoultre, division of Longines Whitnor.